Chapter 5 The room was very still as he spoke. Madame Schuyler forgot the coming guests and the preparations in consternation over the thought of David and his sorrow. Marcia sobbed softly upon her father's breast, and her father involuntarily placed his arm about her as he stood in painful thought. "'It is terrible,' he murmured. "'Terrible! How could she bear to inflict such sorrow? She might have saved us the scorn of all of our friends.' "'David, you must not go back alone. It must not be. You must not bear that. There are lovely girls in plenty elsewhere. Find another one and marry her. Take your bride home with you, and no one in your home need be the wiser. Don't sorrow for that cruel girl of mine. Give her not the satisfaction of feeling that your life is broken. Take another. Any girl might be proud to go with you for the asking.' "'Had I a dozen other daughters, you would have your pick of them, and one should go with you, "'if you would condescend to choose another from the home where you have been so treacherously dealt with. "'But I have only this one little girl. "'She is but a child yet, and cannot compare with what you thought you had. "'I blame you not if you do not wish to wed another Skylar, but if you will, she is yours. "'And she is a good girl, David, though she is but a child.' "'Speak up, child, and say if you will make amends for the wrong your sister has done.' The room was so still one could almost hear the heartbeats. David had raised his head once more and was looking at Marcia. Sad and searching was his gaze, as if he fain would find the features of Kate in her face. Yet it seemed to Marcia, as she raised wide, tear-filled eyes from her father's breast where her head still lay, that he saw her not. He was looking beyond her, and facing the home-going alone, and the empty life that would follow. Her thoughts the last few days had matured her wonderfully. She understood and pitied, and her woman nature longed to give comfort. Yet she shrunk from going unasked. It was all terrible, this sudden situation thrust upon her. Yet she felt a willing sacrifice if she but felt sure it was his wish. But David did not seem to know that he must speak. He waited, looking earnestly at her, through her, beyond her, to see if heaven would grant this small relief to his sufferings. At last Marcia summoned her voice. "'If David wishes, I will go.' She spoke the words solemnly, her eyes lifted slightly above him as if she were speaking to another one higher than he. It was like an answer to a call from God." It had come to Marcia this way. It seemed to leave her no room for drawing back, if indeed she had wished to do so. Other considerations were not present. There was just the one great desire in her heart to make amends in some measure for the wrong that had been done. She felt almost responsible for it, a family responsibility. She seemed to feel the shame and pain as her father was feeling it. She would step into the empty place that Kate had left and fill it as far as she could. Her only fear was that she was not acceptable, not worthy to fill so high a place. She trembled over it, yet she could not hold back from the high calling. It was so she stood in a kind of sorrowful exultation waiting for David. Her eyes lowered again, looking at him through the lashes and pleading for recognition. She did not feel that she was pleading for anything for herself, only for the chance to help him. Her voice had broken the spell. David looked upon her kindly, a pleasant light of gratitude flashing through the sternness and sorrow in his face. Here was comradeship in trouble, and his voice recognized it as he said, "'Child, you are good to me, and I thank you.' I will try to make you happy if you will go with me, and I am sure your going will be a comfort in many ways. But I would not have you go unwillingly. There was a dull ache in Marcia's heart, its cause she could not understand, but she was conscious of a gladness that she was not accounted unworthy to be accepted, young though she was and child though he called her. His tone had been kindness itself, the gentle kindliness that had won her childish sisterly love when first he began to visit her sister. 
She had that answer of his to remember for many a long day and to live upon when questionings and loneliness came upon her. But she raised her face to her father now and said, I will go, father. The squire stooped and kissed his little girl for the last time. Perhaps he realized that from this time forth she would be a little girl no longer, and that he would never look into those child eyes of hers again, unclouded with the sorrows of life, and filled only with the wonder pictures of a rosy future. She seemed to him and to herself to be renouncing her own life forever, and to be taking up one of sacrificial penitence for her sister's wrongdoing. The father then took Marcia's hand and placed it in David's, and the betrothal was complete. Madame Schuyler, whose reign for the time was set aside, stood silent, half disapproving yet not interfering. Her conscience told her that this wholesale disposal of Marcia was against nature. The new arrangement was a relief to her in many ways, and would make the solution of the day less trying for everyone. But she was a woman and knew a woman's heart. Marcia was not having her chance in life as her sister had had, as every woman had a right to have. Then her face hardened. How had Kate used her chances? Perhaps it was better for Marcia to be well-placed in life before she grew headstrong enough to make a fool of herself as Kate had done. David would be good to her, that was certain. One could not look at the strong, pleasant lines of his well-cut mouth and chin and not be sure of that. Perhaps it was all for the best. At least it was not her doing. And it was only the night before that she had been looking at Marcia and worrying because she was growing into a woman so fast. Now she would be relieved of that care and could take her ease and enjoy life until her own children were grown up. But the voice of her husband aroused her to the present. Let the wedding go on as planned, Sarah, and no one need know until the ceremony is over except the minister. I myself will go and tell the minister. There will need to be but a change of names. But, said the madam, with housewifely alarm as the suddenness of the whole thing flashed over her, Marcia is not ready. She has no suitable clothes for her wedding. Not ready? No clothes? said the squire, now thoroughly irritated over this trivial objection, as a fly will sometimes ruffle the temper of a man who has kept calm under fire of an enemy. And where are all the clothes that have been making these weeks and months past? What more preparation does she need? Did the hussy take her wedding things with her? What's in this trunk? But those are Kate's things, father, said Marcia in gentle explanation. Kate would be very angry if I took her things. They were made for her, you know. And what if they were made for her? answered the father, very angry now at Kate. You're near of a size. What will do for one is good enough for the other, and Kate may be angry and get over it, for not one rag of it will she get, nor a penny of my money will ever go to her again. She is no daughter of mine from henceforth. That rascal has beaten me and stolen my daughter, but he gets a dowerless lass. Not a penny will ever go from the Schuyler estate into his pocket, and no trunk will ever travel from here to Washington for that heartless girl. I forbid it. Let her feel some of the sorrow she has inflicted upon others more innocent. I forbid it, do you hear? He brought his fist down upon the solid mahogany bureau until the prisms of a candle stand in front of the mirror jangled discordantly. Oh, father, gasped Marcia, and turned with terror to her stepmother. But David stood with his back toward the rest, looking out of the window. He had forgotten them all. Madame Schuyler was now in command again. For once, the squire had anticipated his wife, and the next move had been planned without her help, but it was as she would have it. Her face had lost its consternation and beamed with satisfaction beneath its mask of grave perplexity. She could not help it that she was glad to have the terrible ordeal of a wedding without a bride changed into something less formidable. At least the country round about could not pity for who was to say but that David was as well suited with one sister as with the other? And Marcia was a good girl, 
doubtless she would grow into a good wife, far more suitable for so good and steady a man as David than pretty imperious Kate. Madame Schuyler took her place of command once more and began to issue her orders. "'Come then, Marcia, we have no time to waste. It is all right, as your father has said. Kate's things will fit you nicely, and you must go at once and put everything in readiness. You will want all your time to dress and pack a few things and get calm. Go to your room right away and pick up anything you will want to take with you, and I'll go down and see that Phoebe takes your place and then come back.' David and the squire went out like two men who had suddenly grown old and had not the strength to walk rapidly. No one thought any more of breakfast. It was half-past seven by the old tall clock that stood upon the stair landing. It would not be long before Aunt Polly and Uncle Joab would be driving up to the door. Straight ahead went the preparations, just as if nothing had happened— and if Mistress Kate Leavenworth could have looked into her old room an hour after the discovery of her flight, she would have been astonished beyond measure. Up in her own room stood poor, bewildered Marcia. She looked about upon her little white bed and thought she would never likely sleep in it again. She looked out of the small-paned window with its view of distant hill and river and thought she was bidding it goodbye forever. She went toward her closet and put out her hand to choose what she would take with her, and her heart sank. There hung the faded old ginghams, short and scant, and scorned but yesterday. Yet her heart wildly clung to them. Almost would she have put one on and gone back to her happy, carefree school life. The thought of the new life frightened her. She must give up her girlhood all at once. She might not keep a vestige of it, for that would betray David. She must be Kate from morning to evening. Like a sword thrust came the remembrance that she had envied Kate, and God had given her the punishment of being Kate in very truth. Only there was this great difference. She was not the chosen one, and Kate had been. She must bear about forever in her heart the thought of Kate's sin. The voice of her stepmother drew nearer, and warned her that her time alone was almost over, and out on the lawn she could hear the voices of Uncle Joab and Aunt Polly who had just arrived. She dropped upon her knees for one brief moment and let her young soul pour itself out in one great cry of distress to God, a cry without words, borne only on the breath of a sob. Then she arose hastily dashed cold water in her face and dried away the traces of tears. There was no more time to think. With hurried hand she began to gather a few trifles together from closet and drawer. One last lingering look she took about her room as she left it, her arms filled with the things she had hastily culled from among her own. Then she shut the door quickly and went down the hall to her sister's room to enter upon her new life. She was literally putting off herself and putting on a new being as far as it was possible to do so outwardly. There on the bed lay the bridal outfits. Madame Schuyler had just brought it from the spare room that there might be no more going back and forth through the halls to excite suspicion. She was determined that there should be no excitement or demonstration or opportunity for gossip among the guests, at least until the ceremony was over. She had satisfied herself that not a soul outside the family save the two maids suspected that aught was the matter, and she felt sure of their silence. Kate had taken very little with her, evidently fearing to excite suspicion and having no doubt that her father would relent and send all her trousseau as she had requested in her letter. For once, Mistress Kate had forgotten her fineries and made good her escape with but two frocks and a few other necessaries in a small handbag. Madame Schuyler was relieved to the point of genuine cheerfulness over this, despite the cloud of tragedy that hung over the day. She began to talk to Marcia as if she had been Kate, as she smoothed down this and that article and laid them back in the trunk, telling her the blue gown would be the best for church and the green silk for going out to very fine places, to tea drinkings and the like, and how she must always be sure to wear the cream undersleeves with the Irish point lace with her silk gown as they set it off to perfection. 
She recalled, too, how little experience Marcia had had in the ways of the world, and all the while the girl was being dressed in the dainty bridal garments, she gave her careful instructions in the art of being a success in society, until Marcia felt that the green fields and the fences and trees to climb, and the excursions after blackberries, and all the joyful merrymakings of the boys and girls were receding far from her. She could even welcome Hanford Weston as a playfellow in her new future, if thereby a little fresh air and freedom of her girlhood might be left. Nevertheless, there gradually came over her an elation of excitement, the feel of the dainty garments, the delicate embroidery, the excitement lest the white slippers would not fit her, the difficulty of making her hair stay up in just Kate's style, for her stepmother insisted that she must dress it exactly like Kate's and make herself look as nearly as possible as Kate would have looked. All drove sadness from her mind, and she began to taste a little delight in the pretty clothes, the great occasion, and her own importance. The vision in the looking-glass, too, told her that her own face was winsome, and the new array not unbecoming. Something of this she had seen the night before when she put on her new chintz. Now the change was complete. As she stood in the white satin and lace with the string of seed pearls that had been her mother's tied about her soft white throat, she thought about the tradition of the pearls that Kate's girlfriends had laughingly reminded her of a few days before when they were looking at the bridal garments. They had said that each pearl a bride wore meant a tear she would shed. She wondered if Kate had escaped the tears with the pearls and left them for her. She was ready at last even to the veil that had been her mother's and her mother's mother's before her. It fell in its rich folds, yellowed by age, from her head to her feet, with its creamy frost work of rarest handiwork, transforming the girl into a woman and a bride. Madame Schuyler arranged and rearranged the folds, and finally stood back to look with half-closed eyes at the effect deciding that very few would notice that the bride was other than they had expected until the ceremony was over and the veil thrown back. The sisters had never looked alike, yet there was a general family resemblance that was now accentuated by the dress. Perhaps only those nearest would notice that it was Marcia instead of Kate. At least the guests would have the good grace to keep their wonderment to themselves until the ceremony was over. Then Marcia was left to herself with trembling hands and wildly throbbing heart. What would Marianne think? What would all the girls and boys think? Some of them would be there, and others would be standing along the shady streets to watch the progress of the carriage as it drove away. And they would see her going away instead of Kate. Perhaps they would think it all a great joke, and that she had been going to be married all the time and not Kate. But no— the truth would soon come out. People would not be astonished at anything Kate did. They would only say it was just what they had all along expected of her, and pity her father, and pity her perhaps. But they would look at her and admire her, and for once she would be the center of attraction. The pink of pride swelled up into her cheeks, and then realizing what she was thinking, she crushed the feeling down. How could she think of such feelings when Kate had done such a dreadful thing and David was suffering so terribly? Here was she actually enjoying and delighting in the thought of being in Kate's place. Oh, she was wicked, wicked. She must not be happy for a moment in what was Kate's shame and David's sorrow. Of her future with David she did not now think. It was of the pageant of the day that her thoughts were full. If the days and weeks and months that were to follow came into her mind at all between the other things, it was always that she was to care for David and to help him, and that she would have to grow up quickly, and remember all the hard housewifely things her stepmother had taught her, and try to order his house well. But that troubled her not at all at present. She was more concerned with the ceremony and the many eyes that would be turned upon her, it was a relief when a tap came on the door, and the dear old minister entered. 